Charlie will be moderating the discussion with Laura Jones and Beck Hamilton, and we'll introduce them momentarily. Let me just say that we're very fortunate to have Laura and Beck with us, and I'm grateful that they arranged their schedules and traveled uh, to join us today for what I think will be a special event, bringing perspective and insight to our topic, Lessons from Darfur and Sudan and Challenges Ahead. Many of us are here today have been active in the mass movement for Darfur and therefore have personal experiences and insights to bring to this discussion. And nearly everyone who became an activist for Darfur has gone on to learn more or less about the history and challenges and terrible conflicts in Sudan. Today's discussion seeks to distill the lessons from perspective on eight years of the Darfur genocide and decades of conflicts in Sudan including the North-South War that ended with the signing of the CPA in January 2005, and which will result in the independent country of South Sudan in July of this year. Gloria White Hammond has said, there is no book on how to stop a genocide. And indeed, we are stumbling along, trying to invent the methods as we go. It's a slow process in which we learn a little, but not yet enough from such mass atrocities as the Armenian Genocide, the Holocaust, Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Darfur. Today's discussion will shed some light on what should be in that book. For Darfur and Sudan activists, the news is too often worrisome or discouraging. Today's discussion with Laura and Beck will remind us not only of our disappointments, but also of some positive results, even if they represent only partial successes. Let's learn from them what we can with an eye to both the short term and the long term. In the midst of the abolition movement before the Civil War, Theodore Parker, a Unitarian minister educated here at Harvard, and preaching in Boston, wrote of the long view, quote, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The art is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I can divine it by conscience. From what I can see, I am sure it bends toward justice. In the midst of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King succinctly delivered the same message saying, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And recently, in the midst of the presidential campaign, a one-time community organizer and then candidate, Barack Obama added, it doesn't bend on its own. It bends because each of us puts our hand on that arc and we bend it in the direction of justice. I hope that today's discussion will make each of us at least a little bit smarter about how to grab that up and bend it towards justice. Sure. Great, thank you, Eric. Let me add my welcome to everyone to come out on a beautiful Friday uh, afternoon and uh, join us to talk about uh, this important uh, topic. <clears throat> I'm Charlie Clements. I'm the Executive Director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. And some of you that may have been in the Cambridge area know that uh, for many years, the Carr Center, specifically through kind of the, the force of Samantha Power, has really been involved uh, in the issue of Sudan, and we're happy to kind of continue that tradition. So uh, we're very lucky to have uh, uh, Beck or Rebecca Hamilton with us, as well as Laura Jones. They're each going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to, to Q&A and discussion and uh, invite your participation. Um, Beck is a special correspondent on Sudan for the Washington Post. She's a Pulitzer Center grantee and a fellow at the New American Foundation. She's written a multi-year investigation of the impact of U.S.-based citizen advocacy uh, on the Darfur policy. So although there was not a book on it, um, there's soon to be. Uh, actually, uh, her book is, uh, is in print now. Um, Fighting for Darfur, Public Action and the Struggle to Stop Genocide. She's conducted over 150 interviews with policymakers on Sudan with both the previous and the current administration, uh, in partner with the National Security Archive, she's declassified more than 600 cables related to U.S. policy on Sudan. Uh, Beck is also uh, a graduate of the Kennedy School and uh, the Harvard uh, Law School. Um, Laura Jones is a policy analyst with the Enough Project, which focuses on Sudan. Uh, you may associate Enough with the John Pendergrass, who's often the kind of the public face of the organization. But there is a solid core of analysts uh, who provide those sound bites for him, uh, and that and analysis that, that he goes public with and gets credit with. 
for, and uh, she's one of those. She's worked as a field officer for UNHCR in Darfur. Um, she's previously worked uh, in a variety of capacities for many organizations, including Church World Service, the Law and Development Association of Zambia, the Watch List on Children and Armed Conflict, and the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, uh, D.C. So um, these are both women who have uh, been in that region and understand what it's like uh, on the ground there. Uh, I want to welcome them. We'll let uh, Beck lead off, and then Laura will take the top from there. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, how's this mic going? Can you hear me in the back? Yes? No? Okay, I'll try to speak up. Um, so I'm actually going to take the historical look. I'm going to take us looking backwards. And the, the lessons that I want to focus on are lessons that we have gathered at this point um, from having done advocacy on this issue since 2004, 2005. And to sort of give you an explanation of how I got into looking at this question, I was very much involved in the beginnings of the Darfur advocacy movement here on this campus, as a familiar basis. Um, but I was also traveling back and forth to Sudan and seeing a mismatch between the enormous expectations that we had about what creating a public outcry here could achieve and what was actually happening on the ground. And I just wanted to know why. Um, there we go. I've, I've kicked in the sound. Thank you. I, I wanted to understand why. And when I was looking for commentary, there was not much that was useful out there. You had voices from inside the movement who wanted to claim that uh, advocates were responsible for everything good that had ever happened in Sudan and should just be doing more of the same. And then you had voices outside the movement who wanted to say that advocates were just really stupid people who were interfering and they should go home. And the truth had to lie somewhere in between. But there was no way to really get at that unless you reconstructed piece by piece what advocates had been doing and what policymakers had been doing. And so that was the, the process of going towards this book. And I think that um, some of the mistakes of certainly early advocacy uh, can't be understood unless we take a look at the context in which both Darfur evolved within Sudan, but also when, within which Darfur came into our own consciousness. So 2003, uh, it is the worst of atrocities in Darfur, the, the worst of the period that this region of Sudan has until that point seen. But what is happening more broadly in Sudan is that the Sudanese government is negotiating this peace deal to end the largest, longest running civil conflict in Africa, the North-South Peace Agreement. And so throughout 2003, Darfur was simply not being covered. If you go back and you look at the media in 2003, not a single mainstream media article about Darfur. It's all about this North-South peace agreement. And there was the story for the taking um, that could have integrated the story of Darfur with the North-South peace agreement. Because one of the reasons that there was a rebellion in Darfur was that rebels wanted to be part of this new power sharing deal that was being set up between North and South. But that integrated whole of Sudan's story was not told by the media. And something similar was happening at the policy level. If you speak to the people who were based in Khartoum at that time, they were sending cables back to Washington saying, if we don't do something about Darfur, tens of thousands of people are going to die. And the message that they got back from Washington was, don't rock the boat. We have to finish this North-South peace agreement first. So you had one traded off against the other, and no conception that these things were part of an interrelated whole. Now, as I said, it wasn't being covered in the media in 2003. When you had the massive spike in media coverage, was in the build-up to the 10th anniversary of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. And it wasn't by chance. It was because there were people who knew exactly what was happening in Darfur and were struggling to get that message out. Because the only frame that people were looking at Sudan through was the north-south frame. And so they found a hook that actually worked for the media, which was to start saying that Darfur is a Rwanda in slow motion. And you had the spike in media coverage in April of 2004, which is when most of the people in this room finally started to hear about what was happening in Darfur. 
very effective as a news hook. Um, but what it meant was that for the public, we learnt about Darfur not as a place we understood in the context of everything else that was happening in Sudan, but as a place we understood by analogy to Rwanda. And that ended up having a very negative impact on the early formation of this Darfur advocacy group. Before I get into um, some of the, the downsides, let me start with the positives. What did it mean to have a mass citizen outcry, to move beyond the model of your sort of elite human rights watch or, or ICG, and actually have ordinary citizens involved in creating an outcry against mass atrocity? <coughs> what we see very clearly was the ability to completely shake up the US domestic system. Really simple things like um, when the Genocide Intervention Network issued scorecards grading every member of Congress on how they were responding to Darfur. A simple tactic and yet so rapidly effective. Advocates had not, not only staffers but senators themselves calling their offices. I've been screamed at by high schoolers for getting a C plus on my report card, just tell me what I can do to get a better grade. So a, a very, very quick reaction from a simple tool. The other huge impact was on funding. Two billion dollars worth of aid appropriated by Congress to Darfur between 2005 and 2008. And to put that in context, that was second only to Iraq and Afghanistan over that period. Tenfold more than any country in Africa. And that's not, frankly, because the objective needs of Darfur, just Darfur, one, one part of Sudan, were tenfold greater than any other country in Africa. Congo, for example. But what Darfur had that other situations didn't have was this mass movement behind it. And that changed the conversation. Instead of your human rights watch person going to Congress and saying, there are these humanitarian needs, there are these human rights needs, please appropriate this money. You could say all of that, plus have the credible stick in hand of, by the way, if you don't appropriate this funding, We've got voters in your district that will raise hell about it. And so that's why you saw this huge spike in, in funding. And then thirdly, changing media coverage. What we always see, and, and we bemoan, and you can see it right now, is that the media crisis hops. February, all we were seeing was Egypt. Uh, this week, the only thing that's getting any play is Osama bin Laden. Now, journalists don't stop pitching stories about the quote-unquote old crisis. What happens is that their editors start to say, well, I'm not sure it's really newsworthy anymore, not really hearing anything from the public about it. And so they stop assigning stories. And you know it's a catch-22 because the, the public are not seeing it covered in the media. And so they're not making any expression of interest about it. What Darfur advocacy managed to do extremely well was to show how easy it was to change up the cycle. So by making sure that there were letters written to the editor every time that anything on Sudan was covered, editors got the feedback, oh yes, the public is still interested in this, and they kept assigning stories. And again, if you go back and look at the stats on this, Darfur was receiving 50% greater coverage three years into the crisis than it had when the story first broke in April of 2004. That is unprecedented. You cannot find any other uh, equivalent example. So a huge amount of power from having this citizen movement. What, though, did all that mean for Darfur? And in turn, what did all that mean for all of Sudan? And this is a question that at some point, I think, advocates started beginning to ask. And, and I say that hesitantly uh, among this crowd. It's not true for everybody, but it's certainly true for a lot of activists, and not, I think, because they stopped caring about Darfur. Everybody cared very much, but were so locked into the sort of founding theory of the movement, which had been the lessons of Rwanda, these anecdotes that became very, very powerful. The late Senator Paul Simon, who had said, you know, if during Rwanda every senator had received a hundred letters from their constituents, then, then we could have done something to save lives. And 
people who were involved in the Darfur movement were convinced that they had their theory of change right. If you could get the American public to create an outcry, you could push Washington, and Washington would save lives. And part of this was the story, you know, at, at, the, at the Kennedy School, um, of a problem from hell. And Samantha was my supervisor at the time that I was starting this research. And I think what we forgot you is... Just explain, there may be some people here to... Uh, sure. The, the book she wrote was called... A, a Problem from Hell, America and the Age of Genocide. An, an incredibly impressive book that won a Pulitzer Prize that um, recounted this story of, of US failure to respond to genocide throughout the 20th century. And one of the key takeaways that became so important to the foundation of the Darfur movement uh, was that the American public had been persistently silent in the face of genocide and mass atrocity. And the hope was if you had an outcry from the American public, then you could start to change the outcomes on the ground. And I think what we forgot at the start of the Save Darfur movement was that she was writing this at a very particular point in world history. End of the Cold War and before the invasion of Iraq. So peak of US hard and soft power. And it was really credible to be able to say, look, if the US just wanted to badly enough, it could change outcomes on the ground. By the time the Save Darfur movement really got going, and it took a while to organize, so it was 2006 before it was really hitting its stride, that was no longer the world that we were living in. Uh, yes, we absolutely had to get the domestic, American domestic politics right, but that was going, not going to be enough. There were other actors on the world stage who were influential in what the Sudanese government did or didn't do. And, and in particular, and those who have been in, involved in divestment know this very well, the role of China, with deep, deep economic interests in Sudan, a very close relationship with the Sudanese government, and a place on the Security Council that enabled it to threaten to use its veto. Um, one of the, uh, the, the things that I think perhaps we needed was a, a much more um, hard-headed scrutiny of what the US really had in terms of leverage. The US that had already uh, put very, very comprehensive diplomatic and economic sanctions on Sudan. There just wasn't that much further that Washington could go in terms of sticks. Um, and you were left in the realm of carrots, which is not a, a very attractive um, notion or, or road to follow down if you're talking about a genocidal regime. One of the very positive um, stories, probably the most positive chapter in this book, it is when activists went after China with this thing called the Genocide Olympics campaign. And it flew in the face of every sort of piece of, of conventional wisdom that you hear about moving Beijing's foreign policy. You ask any expert and they say you can only <coughs> move China with quietly, quietly, behind the scenes work. The Genocide Olympics threw all of that completely out the window. It was a public shaming campaign. But why it worked was because they had the target right and they matched it up with the leverage. You had a window of leverage in the build up to the Olympics where it wasn't that you were getting China to care about human rights in Darfur particularly, but they cared very much about their own national image. And that was something that activists here could target and shape. And so you had two days after it was launched, China appointed a special envoy on Darfur. Over the course of the subsequent year, they did a 180 degree reversal in their position at the UN Security Council on peacekeeping. So just showing, I think, that it is possible even for a movement that is based in the US to once you've got the, the domestic side lined up and got Washington in, into the position that you need it to be, to also start to work these other players in the global system that are really going to be crucial if you're talking about changes on the ground. Um, overall lessons. Uh, so I, I've highlighted number one. I think that this battle to stop genocide and mass atrocity takes place in the realm of global geopolitics. Yes, you have to get the American politics right. It's a necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition. What does that mean for the people here who are activists? How to replicate campaigns like the Genocide Olympics campaign? How to think about other actors? You have this very powerful BRICS bloc, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and now South Africa. 
three of those are democracies. Uh, what are the discussions that are happening in those settings about how to move those governments on these sorts of issues? Another lesson uh, was I think about the fact that it's not enough to create an outcry at crisis point. And the system itself, the architecture of our foreign policy system, the architecture of the UN system, is just not very well equipped to respond to these crimes even when the political will is there. So what we're talking about here is bureaucratic reform. And the Obama administration has certainly started to make moves in that direction. But again, it's not enough just to get Washington to do it. And something that I get told a lot is, well, that's not something that you can get activists interested in. It, it's not sexy. You can't put bureaucratic reform on a bank. I'm not sure that's totally true. I think there are certainly uh, a number of activists who have been involved in Darfur for so many years now um, that have had some sense of frustration when things haven't moved that are willing to look at, at things that aren't in the easy fix realm. And you certainly see with what divestment has done and the people that are working that on a constant basis to look about how do you change the structure of the relationship between business and human rights <coughs> over the long term independent of any crisis point. Those are the, some of the conversations that need to start happening. Uh, also, uh, something about the nature of a mass movement, a citizen movement. It can be incredibly effective. The things that I was talking about in terms of getting the attention of Congress, getting funding, changing the media conversation. But by its nature, it also comes with risks. One is simplification. If you're going to reach people who are non-experts, you have to tell a simplified story about what's going on. I think those of us involved in the start of the movement could have done a better job at not telling that simplified story being solely focused on Darfur, Darfur by analogy to Rwanda, but actually seeing Darfur in the whole of Sudan context. But a, a level of simplification just comes with the nature of the movement. And the other thing about a, a movement of volunteers is that they need to see success. If you are asking people who are not getting paid by a human rights organization or a policy organization, if you're asking them to volunteer their time, they have to believe that what they're doing is making a difference. Now, that's fine if you actually are making a difference. But for vast periods of the movement, in part because of this misalignment of, of target, there was not much change on the ground. And so you sort of fell into this trap of needing to still prove success and starting to redefine success. In the worst case scenario, success becomes, you know, can we send 10,000 emails to, to the Secretary of State? Success, um, you know, that is feeding the movement and making it, giving the movement what it needs to sustain itself, but perhaps not doing anything for Darfuris themselves. When, and you know, one way around that is to integrate the Darfurians that are the, the object or the subject of advocacy more deeply into the movement. And that's something that we've seen increase over time, I think, um, for, for great benefit. Um, the other thing that, that a mass movement tends to do is skew towards policy recommendations that if you get them, will be visible. Um, one of the, the characters that I follow in the book says, you know, if I can't give them that, if I can't give them that movement that, then I start losing people to the, is anything I'm doing making a difference disease. Now, again, that may be fine if the visible public policy is what is needed on the ground. But what if what is needed is actually a, a quiet behind the scenes <coughs> conversation that you're never going to be able to sell back to the people who helped build the political so all these risks that I think are there, we didn't really, weren't really aware of them when it was just a theory of, of what a public outcry could achieve. And um, it's a positive evolution that you start to learn and practice what those risks are, because I think they can, many of them, be managed for the future. Speaking of the future, um, Laura will, will talk to Duff Ward today, but I think it's no surprise to many of the people in this, this audience to say that the spotlight now is really on South Sudan and I think we're missing a lot of what is going on in Darfur <coughs> and this is 
just a perennial problem for the Sudanese people. We, we keep spotlighting just one part of this beautiful country at a time. And, and in 2003, the spotlight was on the fact that there was this North-South Peace Agreement. We were missing the start of the worst of atrocities in Darfur. We got to it a year late. And then the advocacy outcry meant that the spotlight moved over to Darfur, but focused only on Darfur. And then we were missing what was happening to people in the east of the country, in the north. The fact that the North-South Peace Agreement was not being implemented the way that it should have been. This peace agreement that policymakers put Darfur on hold to get was falling apart, but the spotlight was all on Darfur. And now the spotlight swung back again. And the solution to this cannot be to just keep <coughs> moving the spotlight. It has to be to put the, the floodlights on the entirety of the situation. Um, finally, a, a message that's perhaps counterintuitive for someone who's just written what is basically a lessons learned book. Um, but it, it reiterates um, what Eric quoted about Gloria White Hammond, who, who was one of the characters that, that I follow through in the book, which is that you cannot cut and paste lessons learned. You have to update for new context. There is simply no substitute for a scrutiny of what are the local, the regional, and the global leverage points that will be different not only per country, but per period in time. Um, and that is not nearly as easy sell as saying, we know what it takes, here's the book, go implement it. But I also think that a crime that has plagued humanity throughout history, shouldn't we shouldn't have assumed that it would have been easy to solve. And that if it does take that difficult work of <coughs> that local contextual and historical knowledge in each and every case, well, that's just the job that we have to do. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand over to, to future um, proposals. Thank you, Beck. Yeah. Is this working, sir? Yeah. yeah, all right. Well, even if it wasn't, I'm a really loud person, so don't worry. I get told this at my office all the time. Um, so, as Beck mentioned, I wanted to talk a little bit today about the current situation in Darfur and um, something that we at the Enough Project, which for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're sort of a, an advocacy policy mesh of an organization. And the concept of it was that, you know, you wanted to have uh, uh, an organization that could call people to action very effectively and build a network and maintain that network. But you also wanted to have people, experts within the organization, who could you know, identify what the best pressure areas were and the, the actions that might actually you know, have the greatest impact. So that's how it was conceived. Um, a little bit about the Enough Project. Um, but so what uh, I want to talk about today is, is some of the issues that we've been looking at uh, in regards to Darfur and they mostly have to do with given the current situation that we're in now uh, they have to do with the mediation, <coughs> they have to do with the Doha process, uh, the future of the peace process for Darfur and the likelihood of its success. So um, first I just want to give everyone a rundown for those of you that haven't been following Darfur on a daily basis the way I'm sure we do, which is a little bit creepy. Um, but so basically, you know, there, there are still some major security issues in, in Darfur, most recently in the corridor between uh, North Darfur and South Darfur. And it really demonstrates that the parties have not given up um, the idea of a military solution to this problem. And I can't tell you how many people I talk to that specifically say, you know, in regards to the government of Sudan, their engagement in any peace <coughs> process is just biding time until they can take care of the Darfur issue militarily. But we don't want to put it all on them because it's also fair to say that the withdrawal of, of Mini Manawi from uh, the Darfur peace agreement um, led to the, the recent increase in violence, at least to a certain extent. Now, of course, he backed out of the DPA for various reasons, including the lack of commitment that was shown by the government. 
But regardless, everybody is playing a role in the increase in violence and the effect that it's having on civilians. And in fact, it was, it was Mini Manawi's uh, uh, engagement with the government of Sudan that led to the displacement of the people, I don't know if you all heard, around Shangil Tobaya in Khorabeche, when all of that was happening and everybody was seeking refuge around these Unimid teen sites. And it was a really tragic event, you know, um, incredible that there were still thousands and thousands of people who weren't just being displaced the first time, this was the second time, I mean, sometimes the third or the fourth time these people had been displaced. So this is still happening, unfortunately. And then, of course, the um, Sudanese armed forces responded to the violence with aerial bombardments and on-the-ground bombardments. Now, I want to make clear that, you know, we aren't seeing the sort of hut burning, you know, riding through on horseback, the Janjaweed, you know, that sort of massive <coughs> scale. It's mostly now the violence has to do with military operations. But there are also violations that happen as a result of that. And um, NIST, the National Security Arm, uh, conducted cordon and search operations in a lot of IDP camps as a result of this violence, including places where they thought, you know, that were primarily Zagawa, that they thought had some allegiance to, to Mini Manawi and his forces. So there were tremendous violations that happened as a result of that. And of course, the favorite tool of the government is, or of national security is to arrest and detain arbitrarily and, and never you know, give any reason. Um, so that's definitely uh, continuing to happen as well. There's been continued uh, restrictions on access for humanitarians and peacekeepers, particularly area, in areas of this military activity. Uh, some of you might know that MDM, Medicine du Monde, was expelled in February by the Wali of South Darfur. They were actually operating in Jabal Mara, and they were the only international NGO operating in that area. So this was a, a huge deal, and of course, this comes on the heels of all of those <laughs> NGOs getting kicked out in 2009. And then CRS, Catholic Relief Services, was expelled from West Darfur um, in February, but then they negotiated and uh, got back in March. There's still visa issues, particularly for those who are um, doing work on returns. IOM in South Darfur is in charge of a verification mechanism to ensure that the returns are actually voluntary and safe and so forth. They haven't been able to staff up as they need to because returns are a sticky issue in Darfur and uh, the government doesn't, doesn't look kindly upon those that actually work in that area. And I know that's from personal experience, unfortunately. Um, they also don't like the word protection. Um, but on the flip side, I'm, I'm not going to be all doom and gloom, on the flip side, Unimid has been a lot more active, which is absolutely incredible. They've gotten more robust, as the UN, the UN likes to say, um, which basically means that they've been more proactive. They haven't, um, you know, in the times when they've been refused access, they've actually fought it, which I know, that sounds amazing, like why wouldn't they fight it before? Um, but this is, this is a change, and so it's a positive development. And they were able to access uh, Jabal Mara recently for the first time in a long time. So, you know, little, little baby steps, but for the most part, I think we're still seeing a situation that um, is pretty unfortunate and something that I'm, I'm sure we all remain quite concerned about. But so having set sort of the scene, you know, <coughs> given you an idea of what's going on on the ground, I want to move to talking about uh, the peace processes. And I say peace processes because there's actually quite a few that are moving forward right now. And they're all working in conflict with each other. And they're all, you know, guided by people who can't seem to sit in a room together and, and have a chat. Um, and this is probably one of the biggest issues that has affected the Darfur peace process to date. Um, the main ones I want to discuss though are the Doha peace process, which has been going on, as I'm sure you know, for a couple of years now. Um, and the Darfur political process, which is a new concept that has been more or less the brainchild of the, the AU, um, of Mbeki, uh, Thabo Mbeki, the former president of South Africa, and uh, Unimed and its head, Gambari. Then, of course, though, you you can't talk about with these things without also talking about the Darfur referendum, which I'll touch on briefly, 
and the government's plan for domestication. And all of these things have sort of fit together in a way that's been rather toxic. So starting with the Doha process, um, the, the process is being led by Jibril Basole, uh, and he acts as the AUUN uh, Joint Chief Mediator, so he was approved <coughs> by both agencies and was really, you know, the star of this new show that they, they call like the joint efforts, but it's really, I mean, and this is where Unimid came from, right? Um, but this is another issue that has emerged that maybe these joint mechanisms don't work so well, but regardless. So Basole acts as the joint chief mediator. <coughs> um, most recently, um, we, we've seen at the table the Liberty and Justice Movement, headed by a man named Tijani, um, the Justice and Equality Movement, which has a chief negotiator. The head of GEM is in Libya right now. And then we have the government at the table. And the most recent news is that the mediation has produced a document uh, that it says reflects all of the outcomes of the negotiations. But essentially, given that GEM was away from Doha for a long time and only recently returned, all it really reflects is LJM's negotiations with the government and um, it therefore, unfortunately, you know, has the effect of, of sort of alienating Jem. Because even though Jem came back to the negotiations, they don't feel that they've had any part in creating this document, and yet they've been given it to consider and basically been told that their only option is to sign. So this is, this is a replay of Abuja, which is, you know, th these are the talks that created the, the Darfur Peace Agreement, which I told you earlier, Mini Manawi backed out of. Um, so you can see this isn't moving in, in a particularly good direction. <clears throat> I should also note that it's not a particularly well-written document. Um, I'm in contact with lawyers who are working on the ground in Doha, and they said, you know, and I'm actually reading it right now, though I'm not sure you would probably be better at picking out the, the issues, the legal issues with it. Um, but, you know, it doesn't seem to reflect some of the, the core things that were discussed, even between LJM and GOSS. Um, it also doesn't put the proper protections in place. It's very vague, um, at, at least, uh, you know, the, the parts that I've read. Um, so, and this is for a variety of issues that also include logistical ones, unfortunately. So this is something that has to you know, be considered as well when we're talking about the type of engagement we'd like to see in the future. Now, Jem um, has not offered comments on the text yet, but I actually had the opportunity to meet with um, some of the Jem leaders yesterday in Washington, and they've definitely voiced their dissatisfaction with the text, and particularly, particularly around issues of compensation and uh, security and power sharing. Um, they just don't feel that, that it's a document that is written uh, for the people of Darfur. Uh, it gives a nice cushy vice presidential position to the Darfuris, but as we've seen in the past, again with Mini Manawi, that doesn't necessarily translate into changes on the ground for the people of Darfur. So um, at this point, LJM is also reviewing the, do uh, the document, but I think here <coughs> it's important to note um, LJM isn't exactly a group that's been very highly regarded, at least by the other rebel groups, and was sort of pushed to the forefront, um, particularly by uh, the U.S. Special Envoy. Um, it was an attempt to bring the rebel groups together, but all it really did was, was further divide them. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to go a bit more into that, but all of this is to say that LJM already had very few forces on the ground, so they weren't negotiating with much juice. Uh, and then about ooh, a week ago, LJM actually split, and Ali Karabino and Abdelaziz Abunamusha uh, ended up leaving LJM and leaving Tijani. And a lot of people took this to mean that they believe that Tijani is going to sign this document regardless of what it says. And they don't want to go down with a sinking ship. So this is an interesting sort of turn of events um, in Doha. Just to add uh, at the end of this, there will be another civil society consultation in Doha on May 18th. 
This is, will follow on earlier consultations that have taken place in Doha, um, one in 2009, another one in July 2010, none of which have been particularly helpful. In fact, the last of which uh, actually led to increased violence in Kalma camp. So um, Basole, uh, just to also add this, Basole, who is the chief mediator, who has been very disempowered by the international community, is also leaving Doha. He's going back to Burkina Faso, where he's going to be uh, the foreign minister. And this comes at a time when the international community, for a lot of the reasons that I've already mentioned, but will get into in more depth as we go along, is getting tired of the Doha process. And they're beginning of t to talk of it winding down. Now, people aren't saying this publicly, but in private meetings, most diplomats will tell you this process has no hope beyond a couple of months. So the best right now that anyone is hoping for to come out of Doha is a cessation of hostilities. Um, the worst, who knows? <laughs> I don't think any of us want to even hazard to guess. So the second process that I want to talk about today is the Darfur political process, or the DPP. Now, the original idea behind this was to enhance popular support for Doha and enable the people of Darfur to participate in the implementation of whatever came out of that process. But since its initial inception, its original inception, um, the process has pretty much taken on a life of its, of its own under the direction of Mbeki and Gambari. And it's pretty much been teed up now as an alternative to the Doha process or any other peace process taking, uh, taking place outside of Darfur. Now there's been a surprising amount of international support for this. Um, and, and mostly, uh, and I'm reiterating this point, mostly because <laughs> I think a lot of the international community is tired of Doha and they're lacking in options. They're lacking in creativity. So they're going with the D DPP because they're like, hey, why not, is basically the feeling. Um, but there are serious problems with any sort of engagement um, of this kind in Darfur. Um, primarily, you know, is the issue of having an environment in which people feel free to express their, their opinions and, and can engage in the process without fear of, of retribution. At this point, no one in Darfur, no international actor, no local actor can guarantee the participants' civil or political rights. And this is a problem. How are you going to get people to open and openly and honestly engage? How are you going to prove to them that they won't tomorrow be arrested and, and arbitrarily detained? So this is probably the biggest issue, in my opinion, with this type of process. Because of these issues, or this issue, there was also the point about there actually not being an agreement for them to discuss. Um, but because of both of these issues, um, there's been disagreement between the AU and the UN over whether this process should move sequentially or concurrently with Doha. So the AU at this point appears to want to move forward with this process without putting in place what they call or are calling an enabling environment. And the logic here, and this is the logic that was put forward by Mbeki, um, is that you know, once you start engaging, then the environment will follow. Well, I don't believe that that's ever actually played out, um, at least in northern Sudan. I, I don't know if anybody else has an example to disprove that, but in my experience, that's not exactly what has occurred. So the UN is hoping that the way that this will move forward is that you finish Doha, you have a document, you create the enabling environment by ensuring that they do away with the emergency law, the national security law, um, you know, respect for rights. They, they rein in the Wallis who seem to be going willy-nilly all over the place, arresting people and, and expelling organizations. All of these things that would need to happen need to happen before the DPP goes into effect. So 
Unfortunately, <laughs> Gambarian and Becky seem to have ignored this whole debate. <coughs> and Gambari <coughs> has put together a secretariat in Darfur to <coughs> start creating what he envisions would be the proper environment for this to happen. But of course, in the time frame that they're looking at, I mean, it's, it's completely impossible. They're, but they're, they're sort of putting the concerns of the international community aside and, and going on with their own instinct. Um, so this is, you know, these are the reasons why the rebel groups are opposed to this kind of process. And in fact, some have speculated that Jem, I told you that Jem came, left Doha and went back. A lot of people have speculated that it's because they saw the international community committing to this DPP. And, and they got scared and were like, wow, we need to rethink our approach. They ran back to Doha and started negotiating again. So interestingly, it was the introduction of this thing that led them back to the table. So, but in my mind, that says, great, it played its role. Now let's keep negotiating. But that's a discussion that we can have later. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about this is that it unfortunately appears to be fitting in quite nicely with the NCP, NCP's plans for domestication. Um, a while back, you know, the National Congress Party put out what it believed was the, the path towards peace in Darfur. And it basically consisted of bringing the process in, leaving the rebels outside, um, doing all sorts of consultations. You know, when you speak to people within the UN or the AU about this, they're, they're very adamant that the DPP is not domestication. But when you read the way that they're described, it looks a lot like it. And so, you know, the NCP has been very agreeable to this plan. And again, it's a situation where, you know, if the NCP is agreeable to something, you got to wonder what's <coughs> wrong with it. <laughs> it's never a good thing. So just a little bit of food for that. <laughs> now, lastly, I want to talk about the Darfur referendum. Um, in March, the government of Sudan unilaterally announced uh, that it intended to hold a, a referendum in Darfur that would determine the administrative status of the region. So whether it would continue to be three states or would have one overarching regional authority. The referendum, which they're still pushing, is meant to take place on July 1st and it will be run by the National Elections Commission, which is the same group of people who brought us the April 2010 elections and those were not good. Um, so that, that, not a great sign. Um, all of the rebel groups, both those in Doha and those who are not, have come out against the plan, again saying, similar to the DPP, that there is absolutely no way that it can be free and fair, that it can happen in, in a manner in which you know, people are able to express their, their real feelings and, and have their, their thoughts and feelings respected. Um, They've also objected to the fact that the government of Sudan made a unilateral decision on something that they were actually in the process of negotiating in Doha. And this caused them to temporarily withdraw from negotiations. So it had a, a really detrimental effect on that. Um, but I mean, overall, I think this is another attempt by the government you know, to appear conciliatory while moving forward with their own plans. So the DPP, the referendum, all of these things are sort of moving in the direction that I think the NCP would like to see. If they can control the environment, then they can continue going about business in the way that they like, which is essentially to, con you know, to, to keep moving forward their, with their military plans, while sort of like, you know, patting the heads of the international community and saying, see, see, we're, we're trying to pursue peace. So this is all, these developments are all quite, quite disturbing. But then the question becomes, so, what do we do? Um, as I think has become clear, uh, I, the, the current peace process that is taking place in Doha has been fraught with issues, and many of them have been structural, uh, and this has also led to, uh, or is actually related to, issues with the mediation. One thing I want to point out, and, and I think I mentioned before, you know, the relationship between Basile and Mbeki. And the AU had a very important role in this, because shortly after Basole was given the position as Joint Chief Mediator, the AU actually named Mbeki to be the head of the, the high-level panel on Darfur. And that 
somehow like disempowered Basilei. And part of the reason why they did that <coughs> was because, well, it's rumored that Jean Ping, you know, the head of the AU, essentially didn't trust Basile. And he thought that Basile was too close to the Western members of the Security Council. So he wanted to put someone in place to check Basile, but what ended up happening is that you had two very big personalities fighting for the role of the savior of Darfur and putting in place these multiple processes that were conflicting with one another. Well, the UN and the AU run after them, trying to, to make sense of it all, saying, oh, it's okay, we can put this one here and that one here, we can fit the pieces together like this. That's not how it should be. So what we as an organization, one of the things that we started pushing is for the international <coughs> community to advocate for, well, more than that, to put in place a framework you need to have one means to peace, one route to peace. There shouldn't be all of these things going on. This is an opportunity at this point in time, now that Basile has stepped down, Scott Gration is no longer our special envoy. This is, this is a chance to do something with <coughs> this process. So we're advocating for one route to peace, one empowered mediator. None of this, like, people running around working against each other. We want one person empowered with expertise who can manage, can take care of some of these logistical issues that ended up, you know, that led to the creation of a shoddy document in Doha. And these are the type of things that we believe will help reinvigorate the Doha process. Now, I want to point out that, you know, we're not opposed to having an internal process. In fact, I'm of the belief that you can't really have true civil society engagement outside of Darfur. It hasn't worked. They've tried it now multiple times. But you also can't do it in Darfur until, you know, the, the environment is there, until the people, until, you know, everyone is ready for it. So it's important that we continue to pursue these outside negotiations have that route to peace in Darfur that everybody has agreed to with one mediator, and then when the time is right, we can have a document that we then sell. But until that happens, until the, the, the ground is right, there's no way that it's going to work. So I think I'm going to stop there, now that I've given you all my <coughs> peace in Darfur lecture, and <laughs> we'll go ahead and take some questions. <laughs> Good. Thank you, uh, Laura. Uh, let me mention that uh, we have a number of people in the room that I uh, would like to invite uh, your questions to if you would like to. Uh, Dr. Mohammed is the winner of the Robert F. Kennedy uh, Human Rights Award, uh, worked in South Darfur for some time documenting torture, documenting gender-based violence, uh, and uh, is uh, working uh, with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Uh, please feel free to direct any questions toward him. And Eric Cohen here, who is a uh, Pretty modest, uh, you know, is one of the founders of Investors Against Genocide, in addition to leading, uh, being one of the uh, leaders of the uh, Manistar Four Coalition. Uh, he and some colleagues started the uh, Investors Against Genocide, which has had a, a, a very uh, major impact in a very short period of time. Um, or uh, direct questions at, at, at uh, uh, Beck or at Laura. I want to point to a degree the North South struggle had been a struggle of, of Muslims uh, against animists and Christians. So it really invigorated um, the Christian activists in this country in a way that they hadn't been for years. And they had their man in the White House who really had the ear of the president. So maybe I could just ask you to comment on that. On that. Um, it, actually, Mike, Mike Gerson gave me a, a quote that I, I don't think he perhaps uh, appreciated what I was, when it was put in context, quite <coughs> how it would come out. Um, having, having had Laura just, just give you the, the full run of peace processes in Darfur, you know, what I'm covering when I'm looking historically is how it, it is that we got a 2006 Darfur peace agreement um, that was dead on arrival in the first place. And a large part of the reason was that no one involved in that discussion about that peace agreement was actually interested in that peace agreement bringing peace sounds like a sort of fundamental point. Um, but what the US, the reason that the US administration went after a really quick deadline was to get a piece of paper that they could give to the UN 
because the UN was not going to send peacekeepers in until they had a peace agreement. This is, you know, the idea of we're peacekeepers, we're not peace enforcers, <coughs> so we need a peace agreement. <coughs> so rather than putting the time in in 2006 to actually work through and get a real peace process, it was instead a massive push towards getting a piece of paper that could be given to the UN. And, and having kind of recounted all of this, it, it's Mike Gerson saying, the value of the Darfur peace agreement was it gave the United Nations an illusion of a peace to keep. And, and that's exactly what it was. Um, and, and that was how they even saw that, I think, inside the Bush administration. Because they were convinced, as many in the advocacy community to do their work at the time, that the priority was just to get UN peacekeepers on the ground. Um, again, lessons of the wonder if we just get the peacekeepers in there and they'll be able to solve it all um, without putting the time into getting the different conditions that would have enabled those peacekeepers to actually be successful. The other thing that, that is interesting on the Mike Gerson story is you're right, he really did have the ear of the president and um, the number of times he was able to put things in the president's inbox things that were critical of the Bush administration. President Bush very much saw himself as Sudan was going to be his key foreign policy success. Having managed to get this North-South peace agreement that ended the longest running civil war in Africa, Sudan was supposed to be his success story. And so he felt personally very, um, took very personally the, the criticism that was then raised over the failures in Darfur. And Mike Gerson was able to use what was out there in the public because of the advocates um, to get that message inside the, to the very highest levels. How many Harvard Kennedy School students do we have here tonight, just out of curiosity? Um, about uh, three or four. I was going to mention that uh, this case could easily end up in, in uh, uh, the course that Sarah Sewell teaches on human rights and U.S. foreign policy, you know, that you have everything that you need to move foreign policy. You've got a an engaged constituency. You've got Congress people are fearful that uh, they might have a uh, you know a pressure put against them that could jeopardize their constituency. You've got an insider in the White House. You've got uh, people in the foreign policy uh, apparatus that are concerned about Sudan, uh, and yet it didn't it didn't move the policy uh, to an effective level. So I suspect this may end up being a, a case study in how human rights and foreign policy doesn't work. Uh, at times, despite having all the elements in place.